This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Wendigo The shadows are growing long. The air is growing cold. The leaves are turning red. The autumnal equinox has passed, and Earth approaches its perihelion. And that means winter is coming. But before winter can come, we have to get through the harvest. And before the harvest comes Halloween. And this year, we've decided to celebrate Halloween by discussing the five W's of Halloween. No, not who, what, where, why, and when. We already discussed all of those a few years ago, and we did an episode for Halloween entitled Halloween. No, this year, we're going to discuss five terrifying monsters that all start with the letter W. Why W? Well, because three of the monsters we wanted to talk about started with W, and we never turned down a good theme, no matter how nonsensical. So we just picked out two more. Sorry, we hope you weren't expecting a better reason than that. So, without further ado, because given this completely nonsensical reasoning, any further ado would be too much ado about nothing, without further ado... We present the first W of Halloween, the Wendigo. We admit the Wendigo is not exactly an off-the-gaming-shelf sort of name in Dungeons & Dragons and other tabletop role-playing games. It's one of those monsters that usually has to wait until all the more famous monsters have been trotted out to fill the first few core monster manuals and compendiums and bestiaries and hacklepedias. But that doesn't mean it's not a cool monster. In fact, it's downright cold. Icy cold. Which is why it's a perfect beast to talk about as our minds turn toward the autumn and the harvest and the upcoming winter. But we'll get back to that. See, the Wendigo has always been one of those B-list sorts of monsters. The sort of thing you trot out for your supernatural horror-themed television series after you've done all the famous things like aliens and zombies and werewolves and vampires. X-Files, Charmed, Supernatural, Grimm, they've all gotten around to the Wendigo eventually. Heck, even the animated series My Little Pony Friendship is Magic eventually stuck a Wendigo into the show while they were rooting around for a mythological name and a wintry theme to attach to a spirit of disharmony and unfriendliness. Admittedly, the Wendigos in that episode were pretty badass. And yes, we actually watched an episode of My Little Pony for you people. Oh, the sacrifices we make. But the Wendigos in these shows, and in various video games and other media, bear very little resemblance to the creature's bone-chilling mythological origins. And again, we mean that literally. Expect lots of bones, and a lot of chilling in this story. This episode is going to be a little unpleasant. If you're squeamish, you might want to skip it. In modern media, it was probably horror writer Stephen King who is most responsible for the Wendigo's presence on the list of supernatural horrors. The story begins in 1978, with a dead cat. Sorry, we did warn you. You've probably heard of Stephen Edward King, the American horror author. The horror film about a deranged, sewer-dwelling clown that terrorizes a New England town called It that was recently released was in fact based on another horror film about a deranged, sewer-dwelling clown that, you know, and that other film was based on a book about a deranged sewer dwelling, yada, 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 yada. And that book was written by Stephen King. 
Why the film had to be remade is something that only a deranged, sewer-dwelling executive terrorizing Hollywood could possibly understand. But we digress. Back in 1978, Stephen King was coming off a major run of success after a fairly rocky start. He had graduated from the University of Maine in 1970 with a bachelor's degree in English and a qualification to teach said language at the high school level. But no such jobs were forthcoming. After working numerous odd jobs and marrying his college sweetheart, King finally found a small but steady income publishing short stories in various magazines. A job which he continued even after finding a temporary teaching position. In 1973, he wrote his first novel about an abused teenage girl with terrible psychic powers. He sold Carrie to Doubleday, and it was a success. Following that, though he suffered some terrible losses in his family and struggled with alcoholism, he successfully published three more novels, Salem's Lot, the Shining, and The Stand. And so it was that in 1978, the University of Maine invited him back to teach a course in creative writing for a year. And that's when his daughter's cat died. See, there was an extremely busy road in Orrington, Maine. One that claimed a lot of local pets. And the children of the neighborhood had set up a little cemetery to bury their departed furry friends. And when the road claimed Naomi King's cat, Smucky, and they buried the cat in the makeshift little necropolis, Stephen King was struck with inspiration. Dark inspiration. And that inspiration became his 1983 novel entitled Pet Cemetery about a small, makeshift graveyard for lost four-legged companions, which had the unfortunate tendency to return to life whatever was buried within it. Why unfortunate? Because the newly undeceased animal, or by the story's end, the protagonist's wife, is much worse off after the return trip from the hereafter. It doesn't stop rotting, for one thing, just because it's still moving. And it's also extremely aggressive. Violently, dangerously so. What does any of this have to do with the Wendigo? Well, it turns out that the Pet Cemetery was actually an ancient burial site where a cannibalistic tribe of Native Americans buried the remains of their meals and their activities had attracted a terrible spirit of death which had cursed the place. The spirit's name? Wendigo. Now King's Wendigo gets us a little closer to the true mythological origins of the Wendigo. For one thing, it has Native Americans in it. For another, it has cannibals. But we can do even better, literarily. We just have to go back a little further. To an author who H.P. Lovecraft named one of his favorite writers and a master of modern horror. Well, modern for H.P. Lovecraft. A man named Algernon Henry Blackwood. Like King, Blackwood was college educated. And like King... He had many different jobs and struggled a bit. And like King, he got his start as an author by publishing occasional short pieces in various periodicals. And like King, once he got successful writing, he moved back home. Of course, Blackwood's home wasn't New England. It was England. And like King, one of his most famous stories also featured a Wendigo. The story, entitled The Wendigo, 
tells the story of a hunting party lost in the woods of the Canadian wilderness. The cruel wilderness takes its toll on the hunting party. One of them is driven to madness, and they are terrorized by... Well, we don't want to spoil it. It's worth the read, and it's only a short story. Go check it out. And now we're starting to really find the Wendigo, because the Wendigo isn't some giant monster that preys on people foolish enough to wander into the wilds. It isn't a necromancer. It isn't three magical horses made of wind that try to freeze the ponies of Equestria. The Wendigo is the madness that is born of frigid cold and desperation. The myth of the Wendigo originates in the Algonquin people of North America. And we have to be really clear when we talk about the Algonquin people. There are two different meanings in that name. The first meaning, the one we mean, is the tribe of Native Americans who originally dwelt in the forested Ottawa River Valley in present-day Quebec and Ontario. The second meaning is a bit broader. By that meaning, the Algonquin are a broad collection of Native American tribes occupying the Great Lakes region of North America, the northeastern and eastern regions of the present-day United States, and the bordering present-day Canadian provinces. See, many Native American tribes shared linguistic and cultural traits due to common ancestries, but over time, those tribes diverged greatly both in lifestyle and in culture. The Algonquin people, along with their neighbors, the Innu and the Ojibwa, tended to organize themselves into extended patrilineal family units. During the summer months, they dwelled in longhouse villages and relied on fishing, gathering, and some corn farming. Some groups were also known to tap maple trees for syrup. During the winter, though, they could no longer rely on farming and gathering for survival. So the villages would disperse and spread across the landscape to hunt terrestrial mammals. And it was during these winter months, when the Algonquin people left the shelter of their villages and wandered the cold wilderness hunting for food, that they were vulnerable to the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a malevolent spirit of wilderness. It is associated with cold and winter, but more so, it is associated with famine, starvation, and cannibalism. The appearance of the Wendigo varies wildly from legend to legend. Some legends describe it as a gaunt, ghoulish creature ashy gray, a starving, emaciated thing of the grave. Others describe it as bestial or demon-like, and still others describe it as completely incorporeal, a ghostly spirit thing and thus many depictions settle on it being indistinct, an intangible shapeshifter made of wind and cold and hunger. The Wendigo is a ravenous creature. It is relentless in its pursuit of prey, and no meal ever satisfies it. It devours without mercy, and it thrives in the frigid cold. But none of that speaks to the true horror of the Wendigo. Because the Wendigo can possess anyone. A person who is taken over by the Wendigo becomes as the Wendigo itself. Ravenous, merciless, endlessly hungry, and worst of all, cannibalistic. And cannibalism, the practice of eating the flesh of your own species could also attract the Wendigo. Thus, the Algonquin considered cannibalism to be one of the worst sins. No matter how cold the winter, no matter how scarce the food, you did not eat the flesh of your own. Because you would become the Wendigo. You would lose what made you human. You would become the monster. Now, the Wendigo myth is an appropriate cautionary tale for hunter groups who may find themselves struggling to find food in the harsh winters of North America. But the Algonquin people are not the only people of the world to consider cannibalism to be inappropriate, to say the least. 
In point of fact, cannibalism is shunned by most of the human world, particularly these days. But that wasn't always the case. There is archaeological evidence to suggest that Homo antecessor, the last common ancestor between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, that's us. There's evidence that Homo antecessor relied on cannibalism as part of their balanced diet. Even when other food sources were available, Homo antecessor would often hold cannibal feasts at which members of defeated rival tribes were the guests of honor, as it were. And between 40,000 and 50,000 years ago, when Neanderthals and Homo sapiens coexisted and interbred, both practiced cannibalism. Especially when food was scarce. Human and Neanderthal fossils excavated from a burial cave in El Cidron, Spain, for example, show signs of having been chewed by human teeth. In 2011, a paleozoologist and archaeologist from the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, named Stéphanie Pian, published findings that southeastern European early humans practiced ritual cannibalism as part of their funeral rites approximately 32,000 years ago. As a fun fact, she also discovered that they were some of the first humans to wear jewelry. Those two facts are probably unrelated. But those stories give the impression that cannibalism is a relic we left in our prehistory. Unfortunately, that's not entirely the case. As the Algonquin recognized in their Wendigo myths, any given human being might be just one bad winter or long famine away from cannibalism. When the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem in 70 CE, for example, the starving residents of the city resorted to cannibalism to survive. And, in an ironic twist, in 1098, the crusaders who besieged the city of Marat were forced to turn to eating their own vanquished foes after they had conquered the city. Their siege had stretched so long that their own supplies had dwindled, and by the time they managed to claim the city, there was no food left in the city. And throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, it was not uncommon for starving peasants to turn to cannibalism in times of famine. But the most famous story of desperation-fueled cannibalism, of people being taken by the Wendigo, is the story of the Donner Party. And that story, one of the worst tragedies in American Western expansion, began with one man reading a book. In 1846, Illinois businessman James Fraser Reed dreamed of getting rich in a newly opened territory called California. He also hoped that his wife's failing health would be improved by the pleasant coastal climate. But there was just one little problem. The trip was 2,500 miles across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains, and the land was trackless and difficult to navigate which you might remember from our episode about trailblazing. But Reed had just read a book called The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California by Lansford W. Hastings, and it advertised a fantastic shortcut, one that would cut out 500 of the harshest miles of the trip to the Western Territories. The problem was that the shortcut, technically, did not exist. Hastings had never made the trip himself, and the route was one he theorized based on looking at some maps while he was thinking about the possibility of maybe attempting to begin to build his own empire in California someday, possibly, if he got around to it. Reed soon sold others on his promise of riches and the easy trip, and soon 
Almost 90 men, women, and children joined him in 25 covered wagons. The party included two adventurous seasoned travelers, brothers by the names of George and Jacob Donner. It also included George's wife, Tamzine, Jacob's wife, Elizabeth, and the 12 children they had between them and from prior marriages. The trek was arduous from the very beginning. Following Hastings' directions, the party got bogged down in the Wasatch Mountains and had to abandon two of their wagons. Then, the two-day trip across the Great Salt Lake Desert stretched into five days. Supplies ran low. More wagons were abandoned. Several members of the party died. Resentment grew toward Hastings and by extension toward Reed. Tempers were running high. And when Reed confronted one of his teamsters over his treatment of the oxen pulling one of the wagons, tempers finally exploded. The teamsters argued, the argument escalated, and Reed stabbed the teamster in the stomach. At that point, George and Jacob Donner took control of the situation. Reed was abandoned in the wilderness. The Donner brothers led the party as best they could but the journey's hardships only continued to mount. They were attacked by Paiute Indians, and many of their oxen were killed. And they were essentially starving by the time they reached the start of the final leg of the journey, the push through the Sierra Madre Mountains. But then the party caught a lucky break. One of their scouts had managed to reach a fort on the other side of the mountains and returned with mules loaded with fresh supplies and two Native American guides to help them over the pass. And then the party, now the Donner Party, made a fatal mistake. They decided to rest for a week before they made the push into the mountains. As they made their way into the highlands after their rest, but before they could reach the pass proper, Snow began to fall, and the party became trapped on the shore of a mountain lake that is now called Donner Lake. The severe snow kept them from pushing forward into the pass or backtracking into the lowlands. Their scouts and guides who had gone on ahead could not return to the rest of the party. After a month trapped on the lakeside, the party had slaughtered and eaten all of their oxen and had no other supplies. A desperate group of nine men, five women, and one child left the camp with snowshoes, determined to cross the mountains and reach Sutter's Fort on the other side. The hikers ran short of food and went three days without anything to eat. And when one of their number collapsed from exposure, the desperate group resorted to cannibalism. Two weeks later, the hikers reached the other side of the mountain. Well, two of the nine men did, and all five of the women. The rest had died along the way, and they had been eaten by the others. When the hikers reached Sutter's Fort and told their tale, rescue parties were sent into the mountains to rescue the rest of the stranded Donner Party. In total, four rescue parties were sent, and what they found was grisly, to say the least. Two-thirds of the men and one-third of the women and children had perished. Many of the survivors were in shock and mentally disturbed. All were malnourished, and the evidence was unmistakable. They had only survived by eating their own dead. All told, about half of the original group of settlers had survived the ordeal. News of the tragedy spread across the country, and immigration to California fell off sharply. At least until 1848, when gold was discovered at John Sutter's Mill in California. Now, morally... Most people have an aversion to cannibalism, and that's reason enough not to engage in the practice. But there are genuine health risks associated with cannibalism. 
Consider the story of the Fori people of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is an island nation north of Australia in the South Pacific, and its rugged highlands were thought to be completely devoid of people for a long time. That is, until Australian gold prospectors in the 1930s discovered hundreds of thousands of people living there. Among them was a tribe of 11,000 people known as the Foray. And when anthropologists followed the prospectors to New Guinea in the 1950s to study the people there, they discovered the Foray were dying. And they knew it. A strange illness had appeared amongst the people, especially amongst the women and children. They called it kuru, or trembling, because the initial symptoms included a loss of muscle control. First, the afflicted would develop trouble walking. Then they'd lose control of their limbs completely. As the sickness advanced, the victim would lose control of their emotions. And that's how the illness earned the nickname Laughing Death. Within a year, the victim would lose control of all of their bodily functions and then die. The Foray were terrified. They were convinced they were cursed. And they knew their end was near. In many villages, there were no young women left. And the researchers who started to look into the plight of the Foray people were equally baffled. They'd ruled out infections, contamination, and even genetic illnesses based on the way the disease was spreading. After all, it never appeared in adult men but it appeared in boys younger than eight. And then, a group of researchers led by biologist Shirley Lindenbaum figured it out. You see, the Fori felt it was disrespectful to allow their dead to be eaten by worms or maggots. So they ate their own dead. Or more specifically, they ate specific parts of the dead that were considered sacred including the brain and gallbladder. Or even more specifically, adult women ate the brains and gallbladders of the dead. During the funerary feasts, the women would sometimes pass bits of the meal to their children, both boys and girls. But at the age of eight, young boys were sent to live with the men. And that explained the peculiar pattern of the infection. But what's more fascinating is that it wouldn't be until years later that another group of scientists would discover something even more terrifying about Kuru. Kuru was a prion disease, something that had never been heard of before. Prion is an acronym, and it stands for Protonaceous Infectious Particles. What does that mean? It means that a prion is just a completely normal protein of the kind that makes up all living things. Except it's twisted, or warped, or bent. And when it gets near other, similar proteins, it compels them to twist, or warp, or bend. And when enough important proteins get bent out of shape, say, in your brain, you have Kuru. Or more recognizably, mad cow disease. Because mad cow disease, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, is also a prion disease. Prion diseases are still not very well understood today. We aren't sure how they appear. We aren't sure which ones can spread between which species. But we do know they are very hard to detect. And we also know they can build up slowly over time and lie undetected for decades before some threshold is passed. Suddenly, they start killing. But how do we know that? Because 50 years ago, the Foray people stopped eating their dead. But new cases of Kuru are still popping up today. 
and that's just one more reason not to let yourself get taken over by the Wendigo. As if you needed one more. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.